Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star, Jamie, Lily, and Chloe. And in this video, we are going to be getting back into, well, starting back into, um, just like, I'm hard to start it, but we are doing Charles Dickens, it's called The Chimes, A Goblin Story, and we're going to be starting right back up into that, and... As always, please stay safe and healthy. Hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell, and let's get into this video. Okay, I done did the first part a little while ago, so we're getting back into the chimes, a goblin story, the second video. Um, Richard's a long time saying it, said Toby. He says then, Father, Meg continued lifting up her eyes at last and speaking in a tremble. But quite plainly, another year is nearly gone, and where is the use of waiting on from year to year when it is so unlikely we shall ever be better off than we are now? He says we are poor now, Father, and we shall be poor then, but we are young now, and years will make us old before we know it. He says that if we wait, people in our condition, until we see our way quite clearly, the way will be a narrow one indeed. The common way, the grave, father. A bolder man than Trotty Vac must needs have drawn upon his boldness largely to deny it. Trotty held his peace. And now, and how fa hard, father, to grow old and die and think we might have cheered and helped each other. How hard in all our lives to love each other and to grieve apart. To see each other working, changing, growing old and gray. Even if I got the better of it and forgot him, which I never could. Oh, Father dear, how hard to have a heart so full as mine is now, and live to have it slowly drained out every drop without the reconciliation of one happy moment of a woman's life to stay behind and comfort me and make me better. Trotty sat still. Trotty sat still, quite still. Meg dried her eyes and said more gaily, that is to say, with here a laugh, and there a sob, and here a laugh and sob together. So Richard, says Father, as his work was yesterday, made certain for some time to come, and as I love him, and have loved him full three years, ah, longer than that, if he knew it, will I marry him on New Year's Day, the best and happiest day, he says, in the whole year, and one that is almost sure to bring good fortune with it. It's a short notice, Father, isn't it? But I haven't my fortune to be settled, or my wedding dresses to be made like the great ladies, Father, have I? And he said so much, and said it in his way, so strong and earnest, and all the time so kind and gentle that I said I'll come. I'd come and talk to you, Father. And as they paid the money for that work of mine this morning, unexpectedly, I am sure, and as you have fared very poorly for a whole week, and as I couldn't help wishing there should be something to make this day a sort of holiday, to you as well as a dear and happy day to me, Father, I made a little treat and brought it to su to surprise you and see how he leaves it cooling on the steps, said another voice. It was the voice of the same, ri the same Richard who had come upon them un unobserved and stood before the father and daughter looking down upon them with the faces glowing as the iron on which his stout sledgehammer daily rung. A handsome, well-made, powerful Youngster he was, with eyes that sparkled like the red-hot droppings from a furnace, fire black hair that curled above his swarthy temples rarely, and a smile, a smile that bore out Meg's eulogium on his style of con conversation. See how he leaves it cooling on the steps, said Richard. Meg, don't know what he likes, not she. Trotty, all action and enthusiasm, immediately reached up his hand to Richard and was going to address him in a great hurry when the house door opened without any warning and a footman barely nearly put his foot into the tripe. Out of the vase here, will you? You must always go and be a sit settin' on our steps, must you? You can't go and give a turn to none of the neighbors. Never, can't you? Will you clear the road or won't you? Strictly speaking, the last question was irrelevant, as they had already done it. What's the matter? What's the matter? asked said the gentleman, for whom the door was open, coming out of the house that kind of light, heavy pace, that peculiar compromise between a walk and a jog trot with which a gentleman upon the smooth downhills of life 
wearing creaking boots, a watch chain, and a clean linen may come out of his house, not only without any abatement of his dignity, but with an expression of having important and wealthy engagements elsewhere. What's the matter? What's the matter? You're always a being begged and preyed upon. Your whole bended knees you are, said the footman with great emphasis to Trotty Vac. To let our step doorsteps be. Why don't you let him be? Can't you let him be? There, that'll do, that'll do, said the gentleman. Hello there, porter, beckoning with his head to Trotty Vac. Come here, what's that, your dinner? Yes, sir, said Trotty, leaving it behind him in a corner. Don't leave it there, exclaimed the gentleman. Bring it here, bring it here. So, this is your dinner, is it? Yes, sir, repeated Trotty, looking with a fixed eye and watery mouth at the piece of tripe he had reserved for the last delicious titbit with the gentleman was now turning over and over in the end of the fork, on the end of the fork. Two other gentlemen had come out with him. One was a low-spirited gentleman of middle age of a meager habit and a disconsolate face who kept his hands continually in the pockets of his scanty pepper and salt trousers very large and a dog's eared from that custom was not particularly well brushed or washed. The other, a full-sized, sleek, well-conditioned gentleman in a blue coat with bright buttons and a white cravat, this gentleman had a very red face, as if in, uh, in, uh, as if in undue proportion of the blood, and his body was squeezed up into his head, which perhaps accounted for his having also the appearance of being rather cold about the heart. <laughs> he who had to Toby's meat upon the fork called to the first one by the name of Filer, and they both drew near again near together. Mr. Filer, being exceedingly short-sighted, was obliged to go so close to the run of Toby's dinner before he could make out what it was that Toby's heart leapt up into his mouth, but Mr. Filer didn't need it. This is a description of animal food, Alderman said Filer, making little punches in it with a pencil case commonly known to the laboring population of this country by the name of tripe. The Alderman laughed and winked, for he was a merry fellow. Alderman cute, oh, and a sly fellow too, a knowing fellow, up to everything, not to be imposed upon, deep in the people's hearts. He knew them, cute did. I believe you, but who eats tripe, said Mr. Philo, looking round. Tripe is without an exception the least economical and most wasteful article of consumption that the markets of this country can be pos by possibility produce. The loss of po upon a pound of tripe has been found to be in the boiling seven-eighths of a fill more than the loss upon a pound of any other animal substance whatsoever. Tripe, tripe is more expensive, properly understood, than the hothouse pineapple, taking into account the number of animals slaughtered yearly within the bills of mortality alone, and forming a low estimate of the quantity of tripe which the carcasses of those animals reasonably well butchered would yield. I find that the waste on that amount of tripe, if boiled, would victim victual of a garrison of 500 men for five months of 31 days each. And a February over. The waste, the waste. Trotty stood aghast and his legs shook upon him. He seemed to have a starved, starved garrison of 500 men with his own hand. Who eats tripe, said Mr. Filer warmly. Who eats tripe? Trotty made a miserable bow. You do, you do, said Mr. Filer. Then I'll tell you something. You snatch your tripe, my friend, one of the mouths of widows and orphans, or out of the mouths of widows and orphans. I hope not, sir, said Trotty faintly. I'd sooner die of want. Divide the amount of tripe before mentioned alderman, said Mr. Filer, by the estimated number of existing widows and orphans, and the result will be one penny weight of tripe to each. Not a grain is left for that man. Consequently, he's a robber. Trotty was so shocked that it gave him no concern to see the alderman finish the tripe himself. It was a relief to get rid of it anyhow. <laughs> the alderman's a pony. And what do you say, asked the alderman, jocosely of the red-faced gentleman in the blue coat. You have heard, friend Filer, what do you say? What's it possible to say, returned the gentleman. What is to be said? Who can take any interest in a fellow like this, meaning Trotty, in such degenerate times as these? Look at him. What an object. The good old times, the grand old times, the great old times, those were the times for a bold peasantry, and all that sort of thing. Those were the times for every sort of thing, in fact. There's nothing nowadays, ah, sighed the red-faced gentleman. The good old times, the good old times. The gentleman didn't specify what particular times he alluded to. <laughs> 
Nor did he say whether he objected to the present times from a disinterested consciousness that they had done nothing very remarkable in producing himself. The good old times, the good old times, repeated the gentleman. What times they were. They always said that. Um, they were the only times. It's of no use telling about any other times or discussing what the people are in these times. You don't call these times, do you? I don't. Look into Strutt's costumes and see what a porter used to be in any of the good old English reigns. He hadn't, in his very best circumstances, a shirt in his ba on it, to his back or a stocking to his foot, and there was scarcely a vegetable in all England for him to put into his mouth, said Mr. Filer. I can prove it by tables, but still the red-faced gentleman stalled the good old times, the grand old times, the great old times, no matter what anybody else said. He still went turning round and round in one set form of words concerning them as a poor squirrel turns and turns in a revolving cage, touching the mechanism and trick of which it has probably quite as distinct perceptions as ever this red-faced gentleman had of his deceased millennium. It is possible that poor Trotty's faith in these very vague old times was not entirely destroyed. For he felt vague enough at that moment, one thing, however, was plain to him, in the midst of his distress, to wit, that, however, these gentlemen might differ in details, his misgivings of that morning and of many other mornings were well founded. No, no, we can't go right or do right, thought Trotty in despair. There's no good in us, we are born bad. But Trotty had a father's heart within him, which had somehow gotten got into his breast in spite of this decree, and he could not bear that Meg, in the blush of her brief joy, should have her fortune read by these wise gentlemen, God help her, thought poor Trotty. She will know it soon enough, he anxiously signed, therefore, to the young smith to take her away, but he was so busy talking to her softly at a little distance that he only became conscious of this desire, simultaneously with Alderman Cute. Now the Alderman had not yet had his say. But he was a philosopher, too, practical, though. Oh, very practical. And as he had no idea of losing any portion of his audience, he cried, Stop! Now you know, said the alderman, addressing his two friends with a self-complacent smile upon his face, which was habitual to him. I am a plain man and a practical man, and I go to work in a plain, practical way. That's my way. There's not the least mystery or difficulty in dealing with this sort of people. If you only understood them and can talk to them in their own manner. Now you, Porter, don't you ever tell me or anybody else, my friend, that you haven't always enough to eat and of the best, because I know better. I have tasted your tripe. You know and you can't chafe me. You understand what chafe means, huh? That's the right word, isn't it? Ha ha. Ha. Lord bless you, said the alderman, turning to his friends again. It's the easiest thing on earth to deal with this sort of people. If you understand them, Famous man for the common people, all them in cute, never out of temper with them, easy, affable, joking, knowing gentlemen. You see, my friend, pursued the alderman, there's a great deal of nonsense talked about want, hard up, you know, that's the phrase, isn't it? Ha ha ha, and I intend to put it down, there's a certain amount of cant and vogue about starvation, and I mean to put it down, that's all. Lord bless you, said the alderman, returning to his friends again. You may put down anything among this sort of people if you only know the way to set about it. Trotty took Meg's hand and drew it through his arm. He didn't seem to know what he was doing, though. Your daughter, Ace, said the alderman, chucking her f familiarity under the chin. Always affable with the working classes. Alderman cute. Knew what pleased them. Not a bit of pride. Where's her mother? asked that worthy gentleman. Dead, said Toby. Her mother got up linen and was called to heaven when she was born. Not to get up linen there, I suppose, remarked the alderman pleasantly. Toby might or might not have been able to separate his wife in heaven from her old pursuits, but query if Mr. Alderman Cute had gone to heaven. If Mrs. Alderman Cute had gone to heaven, would Mr. Alderman Cute have pictured her as holding any state or station there? And you're making love to her, are you? So cute to the young smith? Yes, returned Richard quickly, for he was nettled by the question, and we are going to be married on New Year's Day. What do you mean, cried Philo sharply, married? Why, yes, we are thinking of it, Master, said Richard. We are rather in a hurry, you see, in case it should be put down first. Ah, cried Philo with a groan, put that down indeed. Alderman, then you'll do something. Married, married, the ignorance. 
of the first principles of political economy on the part of those people. These people, their improvidence, their wickedness is by evidence enough to... Now look at that couple, will you? Well, they were worth looking at, and marriage seemed as reasonable and fair a deed as they need have in contemplation. A man may live to be as old as Methuselah, said Mr. Filer, and may labor all his life for the benefit of such people as those. You may heap up facts on figures, facts on figures, facts on figures, mountains high and dry, and he can no more hope to persuade them that they have no right or business to be married than he can hope to persuade them that they have no earthly right or business to be born, and that we know they haven't. We reduced it to a mathematical certainty long ago. Alderman Cute was mightily diverted and laid his right forefinger on the side of his nose as much as to say to both his friends, Observe me, will you? Keep your eye on the practical manning. And called Meg to him. Come here, my girl, said Alderman Cute. The young blood of her lover had been mounting wrathfully within the last few minutes, and he was indisposed to let her come, but setting a con constraint upon himself, he came forward with a stride as Meg approached and stood beside her. Trotty kept her hand within his arm still, but looked from face to face as wildly as a sleeper in a dream. Now I'm going to give you a word or two of good advice, my girl," said the alderman in his nice, just e in his nice, easy way. "It's my place to give advice, you know, because I'm a justice. You know, I'm a justice, don't you?" Meg timidly said, "Yes," but everybody knew Alderman Cute was a justice. Oh dear, so active a justice always. Who's such a mode of brightness in the public eye as Cute? You're going to be married, you say," pursued the alderman, very unbecoming and indelicate in one of your sex. But never mind that. After you are married, you'll quarrel with your husband and come to be a distressed wife. You may think not, but you will, because I tell you so. Now I give you fair, your fair warning that I have made of my mind to put distressed wives down. So don't be brought before me. You'll have children, boys. Those boys will grow up bad, of course, <laughs> and run wild in the streets without shoes and stockings. Mind, my young friend, I'll convict them summarily, every one, for I am determined to put boys without shoes and stockings down. That kind of sounds like a common error. Perhaps your husband will die young, most likely, and leave you with a baby. Then you'll be turned out of doors and wander up and down the streets. Now don't wander near me, my dear, for I am resolved to put all wandering mothers down. Nice guy. All young mothers of sorts and kinds, it's my determination to put down. Don't think to plead illness as an excuse of me, or babies as an excuse of me, for all sick persons and young children, I hope you know the church service, but I am afraid not, I'm determined to put down, and if you attempt, desperately and ungratefully and piously, and fraudulently attempt to drown yourself or hang yourself, I'll have no pity for you, for I've made up my mind to put all suicide down. If there's one thing, said the alderman with a self-satisfied smile, in which I can be said to have made up my mind more than one another, then on another, it is to put suicide down, so don't try it on. That's the phrase, isn't it? Ha ha. In other words, he wants her to suffer. Now we understand each other. Toby knew not whether to be agonized or glad to see that Meg had turned a deadly white and dropped her lover's hand. And as for you, you dull dog, said the alderman, turning with ever an even increased cheerfulness and urbanity to the young smith, what are you thinking of being married for? What do you want to be married for, you silly fellow? If I was a fine, young, strapping chap like you, I should be ashamed of being milk sop enough to pin myself to a woman's apron strings. Why, she'll be an old woman before you're a middle-aged man. And a pretty figure you'll cut then, with a da draggled tailed wife and a crowd of squalling children crying after you wherever you go. Oh, he knew how to banter with the common people, alderman, cute. There, go along with you, said the alderman, repent. Don't make such a fool of yourself as to get married on New Year's Day. You'll think very differently of it. Long before next year's day, you trim young fellow like you with all the girls looking after you. There, go along with you. They went along, not arm in am, arm or hand in hand or interchanging bright glances, but she in tears, he gloomy and down looking. Were those the hearts that had so lately made old Toby's leap up from its faintness? No, no. The alderman, a blessing on his head, had put them down. As you happen to be here, said the alderman to Toby, you shall carry a letter for me. Can you qu be quick? You're an old man. Toby, who had been looking after Meg, quite stupidly made shift to murmur out that he was very quick and very strong. How old are you? inquired the alderman. I'm over 60, sir, said Toby. Oh, this great man's a great deal past the average age, you know. 
cried Mr. Philo, breaking in as if his patience would bear some trying. This really was carrying matters a little too far. I feel I'm um, intruding, sir, said Toby. I, I misdoubted it this morning, oh dear me. The alderman cut him short by giving him the letter from his pocket. Toby, Toby would have got a shilling too, but Mr. Filer clearly showing that in that case he would rob a certain given number of persons of nine pence, half a penny apiece. He only got six pence and thought himself very well off to get that. And then the alderman gave an arm to each of his friends and walked off in high feather, but he immediately came hurrying back alone as if he had forgotten something. Porter, said the alderman. Sir, said Toby, take care of that daughter of yours. She's much too handsome. Even her good looks are stolen from somebody or other, I suppose, thought Toby, looked at, looking at the sixpence in his hands and thinking of the tripe. She's been and robbed five hundred ladies of a bloom apiece. I shouldn't wonder. It's very dreadful. She's much too handsome, my man, repeated the alderman. The chances are that she'll come to no good, I clearly see. Observe what I say. Take care of her with which, what he hurried off, with which he hurried off again. Wrong every way, wrong every way, said Trotty, clasping his hands. Born bad, no business here. The chimes came flashing in upon him as he said the words, full, loud and sounding, but with no encouragement, no, not a drop. The tunes changed, cried the old man as he listened. There's not a word of all that fancy in it. Why should there be? I have no business with the new year, nor with the old one, either. Neither. Let me die. Still, the bells... Healing forth their changes made the very air spin. Put them down, put them down, good old times, good old times, facts and figures, facts and figures. Put them down. So, if they said anything, that they said this until the brain of Toby reeled. He pressed his bewildered head between his hands as if to keep it from splitting asunder. Well timed action as it happened. For finding the letter in one of them and being by that means reminded of his charge, he fell mechanically into his usual trot and trot it off. And with that, we're going to be getting into the next quarter, the second quarter. We're going to wait till the next video to do that. And then I will finish, actually, read the whole of the second quarter. We'll see how long that is. Yeah, I think I will. Yep. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for more of Charles Dickens' Christmas books from the Christmas Carol, and the story is, if I can call, the, I always forget, the Chimes, a Goblin story, and uh, the second quarter, and you have a nice night, and you stay safe and healthy, thank you.